what we're going to do is we want to take you through every book of the Bible to be able to lay it out so that you can remember each book of the Bible. What's it about? Like if I, if I mentioned the book of Daniel, what is Daniel about? You know, you've heard about that book and you know it's an important book. And if you know much about it, you know that to understand the book of Revelation, you probably need to understand that book. But uh, what's it about? We're going to get into that. We're going to get into uh, what, what is the difference between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're, both, they're all three Gospels, but they're called synoptic Gospels. Why is Matthew writing to a particular group of people? We're going to get to that. Matthew writes to just Jewish people. All right. It's applicable for each and every one of us, but he's writing to the Jews. It helps you understand some things that he has to say to the uh, to the readers of the book of Matthew. When you understand he's writing to Jews, there are things that they would understand that maybe someone in a Western culture would not get. Same with the book of Luke. Luke is a Greek. He's writing to the Gentiles and he's writing to Greeks. And he's uh, trying to convince a guy by the name of Theophilus that Jesus is the Christ. Book, uh, Luke writes another book. Anybody know the name of it? Yeah, book of Acts, the book of Acts. You put those together. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through every book tonight, Old Testament, New Testament. Then we're going to come back and look at the first two books of the Old Testament and kind of give you the theme of each of those books. But I want to run you through all the books, and you have the notes right there. I want to encourage you to go home. I got some homework just when you thought it was safe to go back to church, right? You get homework? Yeah, you got some homework, all right? You're going to have to go home, fill in the blanks on uh, the Old Testament, the law, what are the historical books? What are the uh, poetical books? What are the major prophets and the minor prophets? And we'll talk a little more about that. Tonight, let's kind of go through this right off the bat. The very first book we have is Genesis. And the book of Genesis is the story about big ends, big endings, all right? Beginnings, all right? Can anybody tell me what happened in the book of Genesis? That's the beginning. Everything, <laughs> yeah, everything, life planets, stars, people, languages, marriage. It's the beginning of everything. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. And from that point on, it all begins with God. The book of beginnings, big ending. So anytime you think of Genesis, you're going to think of a big end in the middle there, beginnings. All right, next book. Exodus. What's that in the background you see? It's a sphinx. And what else? Pyramids. Where are those at? Egypt. And what are they doing? They're leaving Egypt. They're exiting out of Egypt. So the book of Exodus is about leaving Egypt, going to the promised land. So we'll be looking at that. Next book. I love this one. You see that guy? He's a priest. And he's, that's, not a, that's not a Thanksgiving dinner, okay? It is a feast, all right? And he's got an offering in the other hand. And what's the guy kissing his what? Left foot a kiss. Left, Leviticus. Leviticus is about balancing feast and offerings. So when you see me up here doing this, that means Leviticus. Now Sunday, if I do that, I didn't mean it that way, all right? Don't someone yell out, Leviticus! I say, oh no. All right. Leviticus, right there. Balancing feast and offerings. Next book. Numbers. How do I know? Well, there's numbers on there. What's, what's, what are the numbers doing? Yeah, they're wandering around. They're blindfolded. You can't see. And that's what the book of Numbers is about. We're going to look at the book of Numbers. Wilderness wanderings. They're kind of out there. And for 40 years, God has to take them out there to wander around the wilderness before they go into the promised land. Numbers, all right? There's two sets of laws, right? Matter of fact, those are duets. When you put a solo, that's one person. A duet is what? Two people, right? You got two sets of laws, right? Duet. You got a duet, and what are they doing? They're running on this guide. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. And what is the book of Deuteronomy about? It's about the law given a second time. God gave it to Moses in the book of Exodus. And before they went back in, remember what he did to it? He threw it down. After he came down, they were making a golden calf, and, and he chastised them. Well, God gives it to him again. The law a second time, the book of Deuteronomy. The next book, his name's Joshua. What's he doing? He's conquering the land. He's squishing out the cities right there. So when you think of Deuteronomy, Joshua, the next book, he's conquering the land, Joshua. Next one. I love this one. What is that? He's a judge, right? And he's on a motorcycle. You see, it's a seven cycle. And when you go through the book of Judges, you're going to go seven times through different cycles. You're going to see different judges. And they go through a time of, of things are going great. And when they go great, what do they do? They sin. Does that make sense to you? Things are going great with God. Love God. Yeah, yeah. No, I forget God. 
So I sin. And when sin happens, suffering happens. When suffering happens, servitude happens. When servitude happens, there's another S, two S's. I can't remember what they are. But there are five things that they go through. And there's seven times through the book of Judges that will happen. The book of Judges. By the way, Judges, you want to understand. By the way, if you've ever read Judges, it's, it's pretty gory. Man, when you start getting to the last chapters and they start cutting up people and sending them, I mean, it's like mafia stuff, right? You know, sending bits and pieces and parts of people to, you know, to send a message, all right? Um, but you need to understand the book of Judges. And by the way, there are things that are hard to understand there. And you need to understand the theme of the book of Judges is there was no king in Israel and every man did what was right in his own eyes. So there's some heinous things that happened in the book of Judges. So that's Judges. Next one. You know it's Ruth because you, you have your Bible open. You look, Judges, Ruth. Uh, notice on the top, you got a book. And there's hearts on it. It's a love story. Oh, it's a love story. And there's uh, two people in there. And Ruth is, uh, it's by the way, the love story is on her roof. Ruth, Ruth, love story. All right. By the way, the book of Ruth takes place during the time of the judges, when every man did what was right in their own eyes. And it's about Boaz and Ruth. Next one. Yeah, you see, he's got a sand mule. How many sand mules does he have? He has one. And what's he holding in his hand? So who do you think the book of 1 Samuel's about? Yeah, it's about, it's about Saul. Um, look at his heart. He doesn't have, his heart is X'd out. He doesn't have a heart for God. But he's the king of Israel because Israel wanted a king. And God said, you can have a king. Choose who you want. And who did they choose? They chose the guy that was head and shoulders over everybody else. The tallest, the strongest, the biggest. That's who they chose. And so 1 Samuel is about the life of Saul as the king of Israel. 2 Samuel. Two sand mules. Okay? When you see two sand mules, you don't see a saw in his hand. What do you see? Harp. So this is about who? Harpo? <laughs> No. It's about David, right? David, the king of Israel. He's a musician. Most of the Psalms are written by him. He wrote a lot of songs. And notice his heart. He has a heart for God. Matter of fact, only guy in the Bible that says he had a, a uh, God had a special place for him because he was a man after God's own heart. Man after God's own heart. So 2 Samuel is about David. How about this guy? All right. Do you see what's it say at the top? There's one man. When you have two people singing, you got what? A duet? What's it called when one person sings? A solo. So you got a solo man. Oh, there we go. Solomon. Solo man. He's got a lot of women in the background, right? And he's got a money, all right? The money that's there, he was one, probably one of the wealthiest guys of his day, one of the most powerful. But Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Wow. Yeah. So the book of um, First Kings, and look at his heart. What's it, what does it say about his heart? It was divided, wasn't it? At first, Solomon had a heart for God, didn't he? Remember, God comes to him and says, okay, here you go. Instead of a genie picking up a lamp, or a genie, <laughs> a person picking up a lamp on a desert or in, a, you know, in the sand and rubbing it, right? You get how many wishes? Yeah, well, he didn't get a lamp. God comes to him and says, you can have anything you want. Now, this isn't a genie. This is God. Anything you want, you can have it. If you had one wish, what would your wish be? It's kind of funny. I did that to the youth here several weeks ago. Things like, I'd like to have a pony. <laughs> what? <laughs> a pony, you know. I mean, I can't even comprehend that. You know, you'd have anything you want. A pony, blah, 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 you know, stuff like that. Most people would probably say what? Wealth, riches, power. You know what Solomon said? If I can have anything I want, here's what I want. I want wisdom. I want a heart to be able to rule your people in discernment. And it says, this, it said, this thing pleased the Lord. And when he asked for that, God not only gave him that, he was the wisest man who ever lived. When we go through the book of Proverbs, he writes most of those, okay? There's several other books that he writes, but Solomon has a heart for God. Um, and he ends up becoming one of the wealthiest men on the planet. He be, ends up being one of the most powerful men on the planet because of his wisdom. But that's what First Kings is about. It's about Solomon. His bag is cut open, showing that his kingdom would be divided. It would be ripped out of his hand. First Kings. How many kings there? Two kings. 
Second Kings, and what do you got? You got two palm trees that are crossed to make a what? It's an X, and they're on a what? An aisle. They're exiled, all right? Second Kings, the nation of Israel is exiled. They're taken into captivity. The northern tribes would be taken into captivity in 722, and the Judah would be taken into captivity in 586. Isn't that wild? Things you can remember from Bible college? <laughs> Those two numbers stick with me. I heard them so much. 722 for the northern tribes, 586 for the southern. But they're in exile. Second Kings. Next one. It's a chronicle. It's a newspaper. Read all about it. Who's it about? Once again, we read about David. He got a heart. He got a heart for God. First Chronicles is about David. First Chronicles. Next one. Second Chronicles is about who? Judah. When Israel was divided after Solomon, let me give you this. I used to always get confused about this. I didn't quite understand. What's the difference between Judah and Israel? Is Judah the capital of Israel or what? And I used to get all confused about that. Let me explain what happened. When, when the nation of Israel entered the promised land, they didn't have a king. They were ruled by judges. Later, God would give them a king. It would be Saul. Saul would rule because he was chosen by the people. He was head and shoulders over everybody. Really, that wasn't God's choice. God's choice was a teenager who wasn't afraid of anything, right? David, he'd go out against Goliath and he was anointed. When he, they went to Jesse's house, Samuel went to Jesse's house and he's looking for the right guy to anoint. And he goes through six brothers and said, none of these are him. He says, I got a seventh one. He's just a little kid. He's up watching the sheep. He says, go get him. He brings him down. He said, this is him. And he anoints him with oil. David is anointed as a, as a teenager to be the king of Israel. And sure enough, he follows. After Saul, it's David. And after David, his son Solomon ends up reigning in Israel. But after Solomon dies, he has a son by the name of Rehoboam. Now this is where it gets real confusing. Are you with me? What's his name? Okay, Rehoboam. And Rehoboam brings in a bunch of guys to get some uh, insight into what he ought to do. And here's what these guys say. What I would do is I'd tax them people. I'd make them pay through the nose. I'd do this. I'd, I'd lay a heavy fist on them. And that, you know what Rehoboam does? Yeah! He starts listening to them and he divides the kingdom. He divides the kingdom. Now check this out. The guy who runs the northern part, when it divides... Rehoboam is the guy who's in charge of the southern part. The guy who runs the northern part, his name is Jeroboam. Is this confusing or what? Rehoboam, Jeroboam. The northern ten tribes end up becoming called Israel. Those are the ten tribes that are taken into captivity in 722 BC. The southern two tribes become Judah. And those are the ones, they end up getting taken into captivity in 586. But Rehoboam divides the kingdom. And the northern tribe goes with Jeroboam, who was a general of Solomon. And Rehoboam goes, uh, uh, the Judah goes with Rehoboam. So that's in 2 Chronicles. You read about that. The kingdom divided. What do you have there? An S. And what is he saying? S. Ra. Okay. He's yelling out Ra. So this is Ezra. And we think Ezra's about. What are they doing? They're cheering. Where are they at, though? They're by the temple. They just rebuilt the temple. And they're excited because they have a rebuilt temple. So the book of Ezra is about rebuilding the temple. Next one. How high is the wall go to? His knee. knee hi -miah. Nehemiah. What do you think Nehemiah is about? Rebuilding the walls. And that's what he's doing. The book of Nehemiah is about rebuilding the walls. Ezra, Nehemiah. Oh, I love this one. You have an S and what she's doing? She's stirring, right? And, and by the way, what kind of car carpet is she sitting on? It's Persian rug and what kind of cat? Persian cat, right? Where, where do you think Esther's at? Persia. You know where her husband is? Xerxes. Remember, have you ever seen the movie 300? You know, they ri total rip off from, the, from uh, Gideon with his 300, right? They, pr they promote, at least Gideon won his battle, Right? And he didn't have the swords and the shields. He had a trumpet. Remember the trumpets? You guys don't remember? You want me to get mine back out and play it again? You'll never forget it, I promise you. If I had to go get my trumpet, uh, you will never forget this. All right. <laughs> Esther is the story, and they're about Persia. And she's married to Xerxes, and this, it's kind of interesting. But anyways, the book of Esther. Oh, by the way, did anybody remember something significant about the book of Esther? I preached on it, 
and I talked about something that's very significant that everybody needs to know about the book of Esther. Some, God's name is never mentioned in the book of Esther, not one time. But do you know what's interesting? There are all these acrostics that are all through the book of Esther where God comes in. And it's, it's kind of interesting when you look at the sentences, the way they're read and stuff. And the, what was very interesting is one of my professors, and his name was Dr. Price. He is the editor of the New King James Version of the Old Testament, okay? Dr. Price was a Hebrew scholar, one of the top five leading Hebrew scholars in the world. And Dr. Price had gone through, and he was a computer. Before computers were out there, when everybody had them, this guy was a computer programmer, knew how to do that stuff. We're talking back in the 1960s and 70s. Remember what computers looked like back then? Remember they had whole rooms with all these things? And this guy was, he was a genius and everything. He was able to go through and show from the book of Esther all the acrostics that are plugged in. One of my favorite ones is, and it's, it's interesting because um, all Jewish rabbis, they know about this. That though God's name is never mentioned in Esther, it appears in acrostic forms. And the climax of the book where, where the king says, who is he and where is he? God's name is spelled frontwards and backwards. I got goosebumps when I saw it. I, I just, I was, I mean, blown away. Frontwards and backwards. And while his name is never mentioned, you see the hand of God all through the book of Esther. Esther, the next book is Job. He looked like he had a rough day, huh? Yeah, had a bad day there. But you know what the book of Job is about? Notice he's in, that's not all state, by the way. <laughs> what do you, whose hands do you think those are? Those are God's hands. I can tell you this, that nothing could have happened to Job until Satan, first of all, asked for permission. Did you know that? And as a believer, when you got saved, God took you out of the kingdom of darkness, the authority, it says, of darkness, and placed you into the kingdom of his son. Before you became a believer, Satan had all kinds of authority in your life. All you got to do is pick up the newspaper and see everything that goes on in the world. And say, how could anybody do something as heinous and terrible as this? Because Satan has authority in their life. That's why. But when you become a believer, you're taken out of the authority of darkness and placed in the kingdom of his dear son. And nothing can happen to you. Now, I'm not saying that Satan can't mess with you. But before he does, he has to get permission from God. Isn't that wild? The book of Job, he goes before God several times. And he asks, God asks a question. Have you considered my servant Job? And the book of Job says this. Here's what God said about this man. He's perfect. He, he's upright. He fears me and he hates evil. That's pretty good accolades, wouldn't you say? Perfect, upright, fears me, and hates evil. You know what Satan said? What's not the love? Look at everything you've given him. He's got a wonderful family. Ten great kids. He's got wealth. He's got position. Why, who wouldn't love you, God? God said, you think he loves me because of all this? He said, I'll tell you what, you can, you can take what you want. You want to take away from Job? You go ahead. And Satan said, I just, I just want to be able to touch his family and touch his wealth. And God said, you can do it, but you can't touch him. And that quick, Satan acted. A storm came, killed his 10 kids. He lost most of his wealth. Job stood at the top of 10 fresh graves and said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, Satan thought he would curse him. Later on, Satan goes back and he says, I got to admit, but I tell you what, you know, you know, let me touch his body and let's see if he can. And that quick he acted. Even his own wife looked at him and said, why don't you curse God and die? By the way, is the insurance payment paid up? Okay. Wonderful woman she is, huh? And all this, it said, Job did not sin or accuse God falsely. There's a great verse in the book of Job. It says this. He knows the way that I take. That when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Sometimes God lets trials and stuff happen in your life because he's trying to burn the junk out. He wants pure gold. And Job understood that. And at the end of the book, when you read Job, what happens? God restores his wealth. He gives him 10. He, matter of fact, not only does he restore it, he doubles everything except his kids. And I thought, it was, what a blessing. His wife had to be pregnant with 10 more kids, okay? <laughs> have 20. But he said, why, why didn't he have double kids? Well, he never lost the other ones, did he? They were, they were in heaven. And he had 10, 10 more children. The book of Job is the very first book in the Bible. 
before we got the book of Genesis, Exodus, before Moses, the book of Job is one of the old, it's the oldest book by most scholars believe in the Bible. And it lets you know that God is a sovereign God, that God is in complete control. He's in complete control. All right, next one. What's that one? That's a palm tree, right? Palms, palm, Psalms. There we go, Psalms, okay? And you got one singing and you got one what? Praying. You got praising and praying. You got worship going on. The book of Psalms is about worship. Praising and praying. Next one, Proverbs. What's the professor? See, I've had a guy look like that before, all right? No. It's an owl, and owls are known for their what? I don't know why, but they're known for wisdom. Their wisdom. And the book of Proverbs is about wisdom. Ecclesiastes. I shouldn't have put anything. I should have just put a blank screen. Because what do you think the theme of Ecclesiastes is? Emptiness. Emptiness. Life is not even worth living. It's a big zero. And he goes through, and, and it's Solomon. Remember the guy who's powerful, has all the money? He can do anything he wants, and after doing everything, he says, life is, it's not worth, without God, it's not worth living. And he says, okay, at the very end of the book, in chapter 12, he says this. If you want to have meaning and purpose in life, two things. Fear God and keep his commandments. And that's, the under, and that's how you have meaning and purpose in life, the book of Ecclesiastes. Next one. The hills are alive. Song of Solomon. It's a, it's a love story. It's, a, it's about marital, um, marital love. It's the book of Song of Solomon. Next one. I, I say what? Isaiah. Uh, let me give you a little hint about Isaiah. It's the very first major prophet. You see the guy who's l laying down here? Okay. Um, he's gloom. <laughs> the other guy is glory. All right. Isaiah has been called the miniature Bible. Why? Because guess how many books there are, how many chapters there are in Isaiah? 66. The first 39 deal with the gloom. Almost like the Old Testament. The next 27 deal with glory. And so Isaiah has been known as the little Bible. I say, uh, next one. What, what is that over in the corner? They're, they are a what? Jury, jury, Maya. <laughs> Jeremiah. He's got a rotten sash. And he's saying that in a court, that the nation of Israel is guilty before God. They are no better than this rotten sash. And you got the, the jury. They're offended that it's laid out like that. So Jeremiah. Lamb. You're right. Got a lamb. And he's crying. And the and book of Lamentations is about tears, about crying. Next one. Dry bones. Yeah. He, he's got a keel. He's drying off with it. It's an easy keel. And the uh, story of Ezekiel is about what? The valley of dry bones. Dry bones. What do you think that one is? Yeah, Daniel. And Daniel, he's in a lion's den. And um, I don't know if he rested that comfortably or whatever, but uh, he's dreaming. And the book of Daniel is about dreams. You got Nebuchadnezzar's dream. You got Daniel's dream. You got all these prophecies that are laid out. So the book of Daniel is about dreaming. Next one. Oh, yeah, this is interesting. What kind of light is that? Yeah, red light district. It's a hose. Hosea. Hosea. What is the book of Hosea about? It's, about? it's about Israel becoming a prostitute. She she went after other gods, and God holds her accountable. And God says, "I will never let you go." That's what the book of Hosea about, is about. He would never let He would never let Israel go. He loved Israel that much. So the book of Hosea. What is that in the middle? It's kind of shaky. You ever have some Jello? Joel. Book of Joel, and it's about what? about the locust eating, all right? And God sends a plague and they eat. One of my favorite verses in the book of Joel, especially for people that have messed their life up and wonder how can they get the past back? And Joel says this, that God can restore what the locusts have eaten. What a great verse, isn't it? God can restore what the locusts have eaten. That's the book of Joel. Next one, I love this. That's a moose. A moose. Yeah, Amos, there you go. And what's he got? He's got a what? You know what that is? It's a plumb line. He's holding him to a standard. God has a standard. Here's the plumb line. And he holds him to that. Amos. Amos is kind of an interesting character. If, if he were around today, he's one of those guys that wear a billboard 
you know, on the front and back, you know, one of those things, march down Wall Street or whatever, and say, get right with God on the front, and the back would say, or else, all right? That's the kind of guy Amos was. Amos, next one. You got an Obed, Obadiah, and those are two brothers. And what does he, he have in his hand? He has a key. The book of Obadiah is, am I my brother's keeper? The book of Obadiah is about Israel and Edom and their relationship. Anybody remember where Israel comes from? Who's the guy that Israel spurns from? Matter of fact, his name has changed to Israel. His name was Jacob. Where are the Edomites from? He had a brother. What was his name? Esau. That's where the Edomites come from. That's where Herod, Herod happened to be an Edomite. That's why he was a little troubled when they said, where's he that's born king of the Jews? Wait a minute. He's, not, he's an Edomite. He's not even an Israelite. So that's why he was troubled and all Israel with him. But Obadiah is about, am I my brother's keeper? And God's going to hold uh, the nation, of the Edomites responsible. So anyways, Obadiah, it's just one page in the Old Testament. What do you think that one is? Jonah, the great fish story. Jonah. There are four chapters. I got my own outline for this. I love it. Here's my outline. Ready? Four chapters. By the way, to me, what would really be great, if I were doing a version of the Bible today, when I came to Jonah, I would put a scratch and sniff page in there. Would that be awesome? Like chapter two? Like, oh, don't, you don't ever want to go there, okay? No way, right? You get something across. Here's, here's Jonah, four chapters. A boat, a belly, a burp, and a bum. Okay, right there. That's a good outline. I like that. That'll preach. All right. Uh, book of uh, Micah. Micah. is a microphone right there. And it's um, God's day in court. God's day in court. And basically, he's holding them up here. Here's the nation of Israel. God said, I've been, I've been very good to you. And you turn your back on me. And God's holding them responsible. It's his day in court to the nation of Israel. Micah. Nahum. Nahum's about the great flood. Remember he sent a guy by the name of Jonah to tell Nineveh to repent. And what did, what did they do? They repented. And it's a great story, man. When you start getting into the details too about what happened. You know, you know who Nineveh worshipped, who their God was? They worshipped a God called Neptune. Okay? Neptune was the God of the what? See, right? right, All right. Um, where did Jonah come from when he showed up at, at, at uh, Nineveh? This fish comes rolling up, right? He comes rolling out. And they say, sitting in the belly of a, a great fish for three days, just uh, he was probably bleached white. Could you imagine some guy comes rolling out, you're sitting there fishing, after a fish throws him up, bleached white, and he gets up, shakes himself off, says, repent. I'm repenting, right? <laughs> Better believe it right there. The whole city repents, and he gets upset. He wants God to pour it out on him and he doesn't but he does later on because they forgot about the repentance and how Jonah had preached and so God sent a great flood and destroyed, destroyed Nineveh the book of Nahum next one Habakkuk it's a ha huh on his back right and what's he on what kind of tower it's a watchtower you know what the book of Habakkuk is about basically Habakkuk is upset because God's not acting the way he thinks he should God ever done that in your life it's like wait a minute God, if, if I were God, here's what I would do. Well, Habakkuk's trying to figure God out, and why is he not? And then God says, oh, you don't understand. It's going to be worse than you can even imagine. See, he was wondering why God wasn't pouring out his wrath on the people, on his own people, because they had turned their backs on him. And God says, here's what I'm going to do. And Habakkuk can't believe it. And he asked the question, why? Why would you do this, God? And so he's on a watchtower waiting to figure out why is God doing what he's doing. The book of Habakkuk. It's a Z doing what? He's fanning, Ziggy, Fan, Zephaniah, Zephaniah. And you have, again, it's the day of the Lord. Zephaniah is about the day of the Lord. Yeah, there you go. It's, he's hugging an eye, right? Hug eye, haggy eye. And where's he at? He's at the temple. Basically, they want to rebuild the temple. God chastises them because they're more interested in their homes and fixing their homes up and doing all these things. And here's the temple laying waste. And so the book of Haggai, Haggai challenges them to rebuild the temple. Haggai. He got a Z, and what's he doing? He's crying. Z crying, Zachariah. Zachariah. 
And boy, you talk about a prophetic book, the book of Zechariah. You could put that one in there with Daniel about understanding the book of Revelation. He has the horses as well, the horses of Revelation in his book. But he makes some grace. By the way, Santa Claus occurs in Zechariah 2.6. Did you know that? You never saw that before? Zechariah 2.6, he says this. Got to have the King James Version. Zechariah 2.6. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north. I put that footnote in my Bible right there, all right? Only one guy I know that lives up north says, ho, ho. But anyway, Zechariah. Zechariah, let me tell you something. There's a, chapter 12 is one of the most incredible verses if you're talking to Jewish people about who Jesus is. Because it says this. They will look upon me whom they have pierced. And they know this is the Messiah, Zechariah. They don't, and I remember I was watching a debate I watched a guy from uh, Trinity Seminary debating a guy who was a New Testament scholar who was Jewish. And the professor asked him, what about Zechariah 12? And I kid you not, here's what the guy said in the debate. That's the problem with all you people in the West. You got to have an answer for everything. I thought that was the whole point of a debate, you know. What does Zechariah 12, 10 say? Well, how about Zechariah chapter 13? The same thing. There are prophetic passages in there that point to Jesus as the Messiah. Zechariah, and then the last one, my old Italian buddy, Malachi. <laughs> no, it's a mallet. Malachi, right. And they have what kind of hearts? Stone hearts. Okay, the book of Malachi. Let's go. We're going to go through the New Testament real quick, and then we're going to finish up here. Oh, that's real quick. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, you have a mat, and it has what on it, that mat? A you, Matthew, all right? And who's sitting on the mat? A what? A king. And Matthew is about Jesus as king. It's going to present Jesus as the king of the Jews. All right? Next one. That M is on a what? An ark. So that makes it a what? A mark, right? Mark. And what's he doing? He's giving an anteater a what? He's serving an ant. Servant. Book of Mark is about being a servant. So anytime you see that, that's a servant, book of Mark. Next one. What's he doing? He's looking for the perfect man. And the book of Luke is about Jesus as the perfect man. He's the son of man. He's a 10. John, J on. And he's painting Jesus as the son of God. Luke looks at him, at him as the son of man. John looks at him as the son of God. Acts. Now, you guys aren't writing all this down, are you? Oh, are you? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just wanted you to follow along so we go, man. I said, some of you have not lifted your head the whole time. It's like, you're either texting back there or you're trying to keep up with me. We're going to spend the whole next 12 weeks writing these notes, okay? So if you wrote everything down, you don't even have to come back anymore after the night. Just one shot and you're done, all right? You won't pass the test, though, whatever. We need you to come back every week. Okay, he's carving the church out in the book of Acts. Carving the church out. Acts. What's that guy holding in his hands over there? In the background. Blue paddles. What are those? They're oars. What do you use an oar for? The Romans. Book of Romans. And the book of Romans is the debt is paid in full. That's the theme. Next one is my favorite. That reminds me so much of me when I was in school. <laughs> you got a, an apple. It's one core. It's a, an, a core of an apple. And that's, there's one of them. It's a one core Indian. First Corinthians. And what's the theme of First Corinthians? Spanking the saints. They got all kinds of problems, don't they, at the church of Corinth? So Paul is putting them back into place. He has to spank the saints. First Corinthians. How many cores you got there? Two, two Corinthians, right? And what are they doing? What's that, what's that on his head? It says what? One cent. The word for one cent in, in Greek is an apostle. This is, this is an apostle. It's the apostle Paul. He has a heart for God. And Second Corinthians is about the anatomy of an apostle. You're looking at the apostle Paul. What's this? It's a sea gull. Gull, and he's on a shiny egg. Go shine, go lay shine. Galatians. And what is Galatians about? Unshackled. There we go, right? Take them shackles off. 
They were chained to the Old Testament. They, had, they were committed to the law. And James is trying to let them know you're not saved by the law. Um, what do you got? You have an E doing what? He's, he's fishing. E fishing. Ephesians. And what do you think Ephesians is about? Bodybuilding. Bodybuilding. Next one. What's he flipping? Flipping what? Flipping ends. Flipping ends, all right? And what's he doing? He's humming. Does he look happy? He's happily humble. Book of Philippians is about being happily humble. He's even got a little tattoo on the side. It says, you see that? Okay, never mind. Okay. You have a commander and chief. And what is it? They're colliding, collisions, Colossians. And the book of Colossians is about commander and chief. Next one. That's a thistle. How many thistles are there? One thistle onion. One Thessalonians. And one Thessalonians is about staying on target. Staying on target. Some of you are still writing. Settle down now, okay? <laughs> Next one. How many thistles does he have? Two. So this is second Thessalonians. Two onions. Two thistles, two onions. And what's he doing? He's watching his what? Wait. So when second Thessalonians is watch while you wait. Wait. Your weight. Watch while you wait. Not W A. W-E-I-G-H-T, it's W-A-I-T. Watch while you wait. It's a moth. And what's he have around his neck? He has a tie. I know some of you haven't seen those in a while, right? That's a one-tie moth, one First Timothy. And what's First Timothy about? It says, how to lead insects. It's a leadership manual, First Timothy. Leadership manual. I love this one. How many ties are there on moths? Two tie moths. Two t Second Timothy. And what kind of manual do they have? Well, it doesn't say, but what are they dressed in? Military. And what is that in the middle? What kind of, what, it, what, it's a bat. He looks pretty laid back. <laughs> it's a combat manual, Second Timothy. Combat manual. What's he tossing? Tie toss. Titus. And what's Titus about? What kind of duck? What, what's, what, what is with this duck? He's, he's got a striped shirt. What's that mean? He's what kind? What is he? He's a con. He's a conduct. It's a conduct manual. Conduct manual. Okay. Um, you have a file of what? A file of lemons. Philem, Philemon. Philemon. And the book of Philemon is from bondage to brotherhood. From bondage to brotherhood. This is, my, this is one of my favorites too. Yeah, Hebrews. Hebrews, Hebrews, we all brew <laughs> Hebrews. Hebrews. And what is the theme of Hebrews? From milk to what? To meat. From milk to meat. Right? Hebrews is saying you should have been able to handle this stuff. And I'm still, have, you're still on the milk. You need to get into the meat of the word of God. So from milk to meat. Hebrews. Next. It's a J doing what? Taking aim. James, what's he taking aim at? It's a faith gauge. And, and James is going to test your faith. It's going to see what kind of faith do you have. This is cute. It's, it's, it's one P, and he's got a what? A tear. One P tear. First Peter. <laughs> You're going to love this one. The theme of First Peter is uh, pain with a purpose. <laughs> pain with a purpose. Porpoise. The wise guy. Okay, anyways, all right. What we got there? Two Peters, all right. And wh what is that? And it's in the pew. Po poison in the pew. Poison in the pew. He's dealing with... Uh, the heretics that were coming into the church and he had to con contend with them and stuff. Um, what's he doing? He's yawning. And there's one guy, one yawn, First John. And he's got a fellowship barometer. He's measuring your fellowship with, uh, with God. 
and the saints. The fellowship barometer. Two yawns. And what's he saying? Shut the door. Keep out the devil. Shut the door. Right? Shut the door. Keep the bad stuff out. Right? Second John. Third John is next. Three yawns. Right? And what's he saying? Open the door for fellowship with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And then this one. What do you think this is? He's doing what? He's throwing them. What do they call that? Karate's this way. But when you throw someone, it's called what? Judo. Jude. And what is the theme? Contending for the faith. He's trying to win the faith prize. The book of Jude is contending for the faith. Revelation. Coming events. Now, if you wrote everything down, you're done for the rest of the semester or whatever. I didn't mean you to do that because we're going to do that over the next 12 weeks, all right? And if you'll take your notes and the very first part of Genesis, we're going to cover that. It should say Old Testament at the top. And you have law, history. And let me show you this real quick. You need to fill that in next week. Go home. That's your homework. There's your law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The historical books, they all fall in order. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. And then we get to the poetical books, poetry. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Then we go to the major prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Daniel. And then, you know, it's interesting. Well, I don't have time to talk about this. I'll talk about it next week. Um, minor prophets, Hosea through the book of Malachi. Let's look at the very first two books of the Bible real quick. Book of Genesis. Remember, Genesis is the book of big innings. The story of big innings. And if you want to understand the book of big innings, beginnings, Genesis, there are four events in the first 11 chapters, and there are four people from chapter 12 through 50 you need to know about. Four events and four people. The four events are this. The creation, the fall, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. Creation, the fall, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. Can anybody tell me what happened at the Tower of Babel? What, what, what began at the Tower of Babel? Well, idolatry. Foreign Languages began at the Tower of Babel. Everybody spoke the same language until then. God came down, confounded their languages. And one guy said, uh, como tal He said, what? What you say? <laughs> you know? And another said, bonjour. Another said, uh, muchos gracias. And they had no idea what they were saying. So the people who spoke Spanish went their way. People who spoke French joined together. People who spoke German. And all them Yankees joined together too. So... Creation, the fall, the flood, and Tower of Babel. Now there are four people, and we're introduced to them in chapter 12. Chapter 11, we're introduced, but chapter 12, we get into the nitty-gritty about a uh, Abraham. And if you want to understand the book of Revelation, you've got to understand this guy and the covenant that God makes with him. It's called the Abrahamic covenant, and out of him comes all the other blessings, the Abrahamic covenant. But Abraham in the Old Testament. Abraham has a son by the name of Isaac, all right? It's going to be about him. Does he have another son? Yeah, remember what his name was? Okay. Why was not Ishmael, he was his firstborn. Why wasn't he the, the, matter of fact, that's the war that's going on in the Middle East right now. Did you know that? The Arabs are descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of uh, Isaac are the Jewish people. And so there's a battle over who should get, who, who should be the ones who are the rightful owners. Who did God say it was going to be? It wasn't the bondwoman, Hagar, who had Ishmael. But God promised he would bless them. And he, and he, and he blessed that, that tribe. He blessed those people. But it wasn't going to them. It was going to Isaac and his descendants. And then Isaac would have two sons, Jacob and, all right, Esau was really the rightful heir. But what did he do? He sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. That's what he thought it was worth, a bowl of soup. And you know what? God let him do it. And he regretted it from that point on. Um, it's sold to Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel later on. And Jacob has a bunch of sons and one who's very significant by the name of Joseph. He was daddy's little boy. He was the favorite. 
He had the coat of many colors. The brothers despised him. They couldn't bring themselves to kill him, but they sold him into slavery. And later on, when he would rise to the most prominent position in the world, second, and his brothers would come, and there they were. And Joseph would say, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. So we have four events and four people in Genesis. The next one, Exodus, coming out of Egypt. Redemption from Egypt. The first 18 chapters, 1 through 18, redemption from Egypt. And a revelation from God, chapters 19 through 40. How many plagues did God send? He sent 10 plagues to get Pharaoh's attention. There are 10 plagues and there are 10 commandments. Not suggestions. 10 commandments. You read all about them in Exodus chapter 20. Exiting out of Egypt, that's the theme of the book of Exodus. Now next week, we're not going to go through all these books. I gave you all the handouts as far as the Genesis, all the, all the different pictures. Each week now, you'll get a handout. And a couple of weeks, you'll get a couple of handouts. What we're going to do is go through the entire Bible. So 